morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Hello, that is my Twitch intro, not my YouTube intro. It is actually significantly easier on the throat, which is why we're going with it. And to be honest, I think it's we're at a point where we can actually switch it up a little bit, you know, because not only is my old intro really harsh on the vocal cords, it's also, you know, pretty old. Like I've been doing the same thing for a while. So if you guys have any suggestions for like a new intro, Preferably something that's completely inaudible for 99% of my viewer base, since I speak it way too fast, that would be ideal. So any ideas and stuff, let me know in the comment section down below. And that was a very weird tangent to go on, but here we are, ladies and gentlemen, with video number two, numero dos, back-to-back -back consecutive Legends of Runeterra videos, and I stuttered there, god damn it, well, fuck it, we'll do it live! <laughs> that's great for my voice, by the way. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we got another video here, and I'm going to go on another ramble as I want to talk about the cards that were uh, revealed up until now. Like, I talked about the tentacle package yesterday, so we're not going to be mentioning that again today, in case you haven't seen that. I did actually post the video yesterday. Amazing, I know. But today, I want to talk about the other cards that were revealed up until now, because I really want to take a video to just go over... All the cards, like, I'm not gonna, like, really do very in-depth review of every single card because we're, we'll be here for a while, if that's the case, right? There's quite a few cards for us to talk about here. Even though the Nagamapora's package is something that we'll be skipping, we even have all the new Telstones as well to discuss. So, there's quite a few things to talk about here, and I don't want to take forever on every card because otherwise this video will be extremely long. And I do all, like, I already want to improve from yesterday because yesterday I did go on a few tangents here and there, which made the video a little bit longer than it needed to be. So, you know, I'm always trying to evolve with my content, make it better, you know, like a Pokemon. So, we're going to try to keep on evolving in that regard as. I'm going to be taking some time, though, on cards that I'm particularly really excited for, and I'm going to try to explain why I'm as excited for them specifically. Uh, not necessarily the most, they don't have to always be the strongest of the package, but there's a lot of very neat additions here, and what this set of cards really highlights and uh like the biggest reason why i'm so excited for this incoming expansion is because i think it's something that legends of runeterra has been needing for quite some time as we've been getting every new expansion there's been an issue that i think has been pretty you know it's been mentioned quite a bit throughout the game's lifespan by the uh, player base in the community and that is that We've been getting a lot of new keywords and a lot of new archetypes, but they've been a little bit too focused on that. So what I mean by this is that we've been getting too many, in my opinion, new keywords and new archetypes and not enough support for these archetypes that we have been getting over time. So in a way, this, is, this has been diluting the card pool and we've been getting all sorts of different archetypes, but they really don't feel complete in many ways. And now with this expansion, which I call the antithesis of Bandle City because it goes in the opposite direction in that regard, we are actually getting a bunch of cards to support old beloved archetypes. Well, <laughs> beloved. Yeah. Well, uh, not, not in its entirety, but we are getting a bunch of support for archetypes uh, that have been established for quite some time. And it's very exciting because a lot of these archetypes really define Legends of Runeterra. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, strategies and, and, and keywords here that I think are just really cool. And it's, it's just awesome for us to be able to expand more onto them and uh, revisit them and, and make them better, right, with new cards. I... I've been asking for this for a long time, and the fact that, that we're getting an expansion really dedicated to this is just super, super exciting for me, and I want to go over which ones are the ones that I'm looking forward to the most as uh, we are four minutes in. Not so bad. Let's actually start talking about the cards. Like I said, I won't dive too deep into every single one of them. I'm going to go over a few of them rather quickly, but I'll give you guys my first impressions. And uh, again, which ones I'm looking forward to the most. So first of all, we got the Maker here, right? The Maker is a 3-mana three 3-2 three that has a skill uh, upon play that recalls a unit with less power than me. So a card that can mix in well with recall archetypes, as it has an ability that can be used like the Navary Conspirator. But because it is a skill, uh, it's actually less efficient as a 
tool to recall your own units at the expense or, or like that's the price that you pay to have the ability to recall opposing units that have less power than her. One of the cool things about this card is potentially mixing her in with some sort of like Freljord Ionia uh, strategy, you know, with Frostbites. You could potentially Frostbite opposing units and actually recall them with a three mana play while developing something onto the board, which I don't know how good that is ultimately. And I don't know if there will be more like reliable ways to actually mix her in with some sort of, you know, region that can uh, weaken opposing units like maybe even Shurima with quicksand, etc., right? But it is important to note that she could uh, go into those sorts of strategies and be used as an offensive recall that gives you a body, which is really powerful, right? Even though you have to combine her with a Frostbite, but I see like five mana, you know, Archer into this being pretty damn decent, man. Like you're going wide with fearsome blockers, you're developing two, three, blo uh, three power units, and you're uh, removing tempo from the opponent's board. And I think that's... That's exciting in, in its way. I'm, I'm not really the hu the biggest fan of like recall cards and Ionia strategies in general. It's not one of my favorite regions, right? So it's not one of the cards that I'm most excited about. But as you guys can see, I'm already rambling about this card because there's a lot to it. And uh, it's it's pretty neat. I, I definitely am excited to mess around with it a little bit, uh, especially with that Frostbite idea. Speaking of Froyord, though, and speaking of a card that I'm really excited about, we got the Harbinger of Thralls. I am recording, right? <laughs> <laughs> just got gotta make sure so harbinger of thralls is one of the cards that i'm most excited about personally just because not because it's super convoluted what it does but because it's actually a very strong addition to the frozen thrall archetype the frozen thrall archetype is actually a very very cool archetype it's actually pun intended <laughs> Arguably for me, out of the whole Shurima expansion, it's the, the dopest thing to come out of that. Like, I really like Thralls. I've always liked Thralls. I liked Thralls back when, you know, nobody played them because the, the best way to play Lysandra was with Trundle and the Watcher, right? Now I like Thralls when they were good, even when they were like top tier. I, I would play Thralls quite a bit on the channel, if you guys remember. And uh, even now when they're not as popular, maybe because of uh, the prevalence of uh, Talia Ziggs and other strategies that can deal with um with thralls itself but it is definitely one of my most preferred archetypes ever and getting a tool like this is really important for it uh this is a very very strong addition for two mana you get a 2-2 body that allows you to summon a frozen thrall in case you missed the turn one or if you played a, a frozen thrall turn one you can play this on turn two and advance it one round it is an absolute motherfucking staple for the archetype if you're playing frozen thralls you will be playing harbinger of thralls as a three of period and it's going to add a lot to the consistency of the archetype because not only do you have frozen thralls on one and lysandra on three you got harbinger of thralls on two which just mixes into the curve so beautifully and it's been designed that way for a reason this will enhance the archetype and it is if you were going to make one card for it it would be exactly this so very, very powerful addition that will actually has the potential to make Frozen Thralls relevant again. Even though I, I think they're actually maybe a little bit underrated as of now. I, I understand the Talia Ziggs matchup is not great, but I still do feel like the archetype is, is better than people give it credit for. And this card is going to, man, it's going to propel its power level through the roof. And that, I don't know if that makes any linguistical sense <laughs> but i think you understand what i'm trying to say here so very very cool card did i say i'm excited for it because i am and I, I took like forever so okay let, let's let's turbo a little bit through this another ionia card here in kiku's call summon a keeper of mask now or at the next round start draw one i love the ability to have this be a postponed effect because you can actually play this on your opponent's attack token turn gearing up for a powerful open attack swing on your turn which is really interesting it replaces itself which is very important as you don't miss out on a uh, card advantage and actually you are going to be getting card advantage because you do get to keep the keeper of mask it's not uh it's not fleeting or ephemeral and i mean fleeting on the board wouldn't make, make any sense but you know it's not ephemeral and it's a card that's going to really um uh, it has a lot of potential in a lot of different archetypes really like anything that goes wide can benefit from this and it's a very, very interesting card in that regard. Protective Broodfather is the 8-mana 7-7 seven, seven Fury Dragon. I mean, most, if not all, dragons have Furies. I don't know why I labeled it like that, but... 
Attack, draw a unit. If it's a dragon, summon it attacking. I mean, pretty cool card. Uh, you know, it's just another dragon that works well in a deck with multiple dragons. You know, I've seen people post on Reddit, like, this card combined with the, uh, the counterfeit copies and stuff like that, which is pretty cute, but I think this card on its own can be pretty decent, even though it's, uh, it's definitely it's something, that we, something you want to be ramping into in some sort of way, because it is an 8-drop, and uh, it is, you know, it's pretty slow at what it's doing, and it also, you know, really depends on the way you build a deck, right? Because the more non-dragon cards that you add into it, the more uh, potential that you have to weaken this. But if it does go through, it can be... Because you can also get a pretty weak dragon as well. Nonetheless, it's it's a very neat dragon design. And uh, that's pretty much all I got to say about it. It's a dragon and it, it pulls out other dragons. Cool. Cool dragon. We got Stunning Performance, which is the skill for the stage hand. Two mana, four, four with Ephemeral that has a play effect of stunning an enemy. Now, this is a very interesting card because it... it essentially reinforces the uh the ionia shadow isles sort of like ephemeral uh archetype from this region combination that they've tried to push since the beta and have failed to do so uh, i don't really know if the stage hand is enough to really change that but it does you know whenever there's the chance of death mark being viable i'm always very interested in that and i'm going to be exploring that angle with this card even though there may be much more to it than that but that's the first thing that comes to mind for me uh personally uh you can't you actually can't see my my oops you can't see my okay now you can see my my mouse i don't know what you, can, you couldn't see it earlier so yeah i i like it um that's that's what i want to be seeing out of it but i'm not really sure if uh there will be more utility for it uh it's definitely overstated because it is ephemeral but playing this with death mark can be really strong and uh even if it just strikes in it is it does have four power so it's it's representing quite a bit of damage and it does have utility in in aggressive decks because stunning is both it's both good offensively and defensively right because you can buy some time uh but you can also use it to remove one of the opposing blockers and push through so lots of stats uh doing a lot for what it's for you know the price that it's doing at the expense of being ephemeral but there are synergies that can make it even benefit from that keyword and that's what i really am personally excited to explore how relevant it ultimately be i'm not really sure ephemeral cards don't tend to you know especially ionia ephemeral cards don't really have a good track record but it is exciting that they made this card nonetheless we got the winding the light a seven mana six five with overwhelm with a nightfall effect of giving other allies plus two plus one and overwhelm this round my nose is itching i don't know why but uh this is a you know this card it, it may have nightfall on it but the way i see it it, it actually can be really neat for any sort of target deck that is able to spread out uh, and develop strong board states with, with good stats. Something that comes to mind that does this really effectively is Daybreak, ironically. Uh, they are able to develop really nice boards. And even though we're getting overwhelmed Leona, I think that, that was provided in the la latest balance patch, being able to give everything else overwhelm can be really strong in a deck like Daybreak. In any deck uh, that can spread out in that sense. Even, um, even other archetypes... Uh, from target like maybe even uh well it, it, i don't know how good it can be in like a malphite deck because it is a seven drop it, it does share a slot with malphite but it can allow you to benefit more from the ramping effect from the uh the two drop i forgot i forgot its name the blue something the blue sentinel i think it, it was uh it is an interesting card it can definitely allow you to you know make use of these sort of like mid-range decks that can provide that can actually spread out quite well but you also need to be to enable the nightfall which is easier than done on a set of, uh, on a seven drop it means that you need to be able to have access to uh cheap spells uh to enable that but that's there's several region combinations that can do that and even target itself has a lot of ways of doing that as well so you can even run the one mana uh daybreak nightbreak card Daybreak, Nightbreak. The, the, I think you guys know which one I'm talking about. Like, I'm, I'm, I haven't really played that card too often. I mean, I can just search it here because I, I do have Runeterra uh, open. But you guys see the Heavens Aligned. You can go with Heavens Aligned and it actually uh, enabled the... 
enabled the winding light that way and yeah it, it's a very nice like late game addition for Targan and I, I do like them introducing this into the game a lot Chamber of Renewal can be decent with uh, with Serath for example you know you can um, you can play this and play Serath afterwards like that's the first thing that comes to mind right like you play Chamber of Renewal you play Serath and then you profit, right? Like you progress the level up, you ping something, and you give Sarah a spell shield. Ultimately, how much Shurima decks need this card uh, outside of pure like landmark builds? I don't really know. It's pretty expensive. That's what what it's doing, especially considering it's in the region that has Soothsayer, right? <laughs> so I don't know how relevant this card will ultimately be. Like I'm, I don't think it's actually that good to be honest. But maybe I am downplaying it a little bit. Now, Revna, the Lore Keeper, is a card that I'm very excited to mess around with. Uh, first of all, just hand buffing in general. Like, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, this, this guy right here. Let's go back. Let's go back to... Um, what's the name of the... Uh, it's the, the Jeweled Protector. The Jeweled Protector. Is a 5-drop that can grant an ally in hand plus 3, plus 3. So, the Jeweled Protector here can buff Revna and get her to a 5-5 five, five stat line so that when you play Revna, you have a 5-5 five, five for 6 mana and your entire deck gets plus 5, plus 5. Uh, this is obviously very slow, keep that in mind, like uh, this sort of like strategy of combining Ionia with, with Froyord and then to get that payoff turn 6 onwards. Like, no matter how you look at it, Revna is slow at what she does, but she has such a strong, powerful effect that even combining her with ramp mechanics like Hunting Boar, which we'll be diving into in a bit as well, is is really, it's, it's exciting. Like, I'm not sure how good it will be ultimately, but this is a card that's going to be very fun to mess around with uh, deck building. And I'm definitely going to be trying to, you know, make this card work with a bunch of different regions. And it's just, it's one of those things that it's like, it's it's a card that's not really, like, what I like about it is, is that it's it's something new, but what it's doing is a variant of an already established identity within Freljord. And I really like that about this design. And uh, I'm really eager to, to mess around with it. She seems very fun in that regard. Like, getting your, like making your deck absolutely massive. That's, that's, you know, that's a very Timmy thing. And we all have a, we all have a Timmy within us. So uh, I'll be excited to explore that. As we got the Captive Greyback, um, you know, this card is, I mean, it kind of seems like a face card, you know, I mean, it is a skill card, which mixes well with Jin, right, like, you can add it to Jin without having to blend in Noxus, per se, uh, and it can combine with certain champions like Swain, even, or, you know, it's just, it is kind of like a face card, though, and it is actually a little bit underpowered, in my opinion, because defensively, it's not really doing much, so I feel like Captive Greyback is just going to be there in you know, go face Noxus decks, and those are uh, ultimately my favorite. Uh, I don't really see much more potential this card for this card outside of that. But maybe I am actually missing something because there are ways you can enhance this skill, right, with Funsmith and stuff like that. But they're they're both four drops, right? You can also use it with Powder Kegs, yeah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But yeah, I'm I'm not sure this card really excels in anything besides just aggro decks. And I'm not really sure how good it is in those specifically, to be honest, because it's not that powerful for a four drop, at least the amount of damage that it's threatening. But it is it is interesting because it does actually eat up any blocker that's that's three health or less. Like that's a relevant thing, right? Like the fact that anything that wants to block it that's three health or lower will not be able to trade into it. Which it, will, it is what makes it interesting. So maybe I am uh, underestimating it a little bit, but I'm not super impressed with this one. Storm of Blades, everybody's favorite play pattern in the game. We have a card that is kind of like uh, similar to Out the Way uh, from Target. It's like a, a, an investment that you go for five mana that just lasts for the entire game. Now, I'm not sure this is what Blade Dance needs to be competitively viable again. Uh, I'm not one asking for that archetype to be competitively viable again, but it is definitely a card that adds in, adds more to the overall combo nature of the deck. Five mana, it's a lot though. Like playing this card makes it so you, you have to play the, um, the, uh, the field musicians, right? Uh, stuff like that in order to make up for that, you know, tempo loss, because you are, it is a heavy investment to go for and... The deck doesn't really 
struggle in its overall like output potential it struggles more so with speed right and this card doesn't really help in that regard so i'm not sure how much it, it, it'll do but you know that's pretty much all i'm gonna say about it it is definitely an exciting addition because it, it does push the, the combo nature of the deck more and that's that's neat like i like decks that invest right in, into synergies and then get these strong payoffs but uh it does feel quite a bit slow at that and then we have the mega tusk can see it there right? the, the mega tusk is uh amongst the cards that i'm most excited about because it is deep it's just that's all it has to be deep i love deep you love deep as well most of you who watch my videos like they are amongst my most viewed videos ever because it is one of the most beloved archetypes ever and the fact that we're getting not one but two new deep cards is the tit as we have the Bilgewater one here as a 4 mana 3 4 slightly weaker than the 4 mana 4 4 vanilla deep monster but it says, once you're deep, heal your allies and Nexus, very important, and Nexus 3. Heal, keeping you alive, healing you up, allowing you to rebuild and not die before you get your scary late game going. One of the biggest weaknesses that deep decks have to patch up. Having a deep monster that heals you up is amazing and it is no coincidence that they went with this design decision this and the other deep card are just amazing additions for the archetype and are really going to enhance it like i just i am so hyped for mega tusk and even more so for the shadow Owls one that we'll be talking about very shortly as uh, that one i feel is going to be insanely good not only for deep decks but also beyond that really because you know, it's like a it's like a good grasp of the undying because grasp of the undying got a little bit power crept ultimately, and yeah, just fantastic additions, man. Can't cannot wait to play deep again. I, I don't know, I don't know how many deep decks I built at this point, but <laughs> I'm just, I want to go back to it, man. It's just it's really exciting. Then we got the sputtering song spinner, which says pick one of two new two cost cards to create in hand and set its cost to zero this round repeat two more times so this is a pretty interesting design it doesn't feel like it's very competitive because you are playing seven mana it is burst speed yes uh i think this card can work in stuff like um specifically in in archetypes like uh pursuit of perfection for example right like you can get uh technically you can get four different cards out of this but it's still seven mana like seven mana is a lot like just keep that in mind it's it's more of a fun card it seems and i think it's it's fine that way because it's also very you know chaotic uh because it's it's uh, it says two cost cards and it doesn't limit them to the regions that you're playing so they can be from whatever region they want so if this card was actually meta like metagame defining it would be uh, quite problematic because it would be very very difficult to uh play around even though i mean you have to play the things you have to play those those cards that same round right so it's not like you can save them up and, and use them as well i mean you can but you have to pay two for them eventually so yeah uh not really much more to say about it it's a very hearthstone -y sort of card uh, not really my personal favorite type of card um it seems fun but I, I do think the fact that it's seven mana will keep it in check for sure and now lord broad main i don't know what it is about minotaurs but whenever uh, riot and laser Terra, like whenever they print a new minotaur i fucking love it like i am a minotaur main because i just love minotaurs i love Arctic glenhorn i love the minotaur reckoner and i love lord broadmain and something about the minotaurs like most of them are like six mana even though there's a the fallen reckoner as well which is four mana i believe so not all of them but man they are such cool cards dude for real they're okay what well, we're doing we're not too bad on time but they are such dope cards, and uh, this one is just arguably the dopest of them all. Like, a play effect of dealing two damage to an enemy, and then it says your fast spells, slow spells, and skills have incorporated onto what already they, what they do already. When I damage a stunned or damaged enemy, kill it. Now, that is so fucking dope for so many reasons. Like, this is such a cool card, man. Like, it is just amazing like the fact that you can you can play this with swain you, there, there's so many cool combinations you can go for you know like bilgewater P and Z. you can obviously go Jin as well like this card can just go with Jin, and you can maybe even go outside of noxus with like shadow owls or combine noxus and shadow owls with this 
and it just it could exactly like, this card could go into a pure control deck it can go into a swain deck and it's just a really exciting card man it, it is very understated because it has a lot going on for it but it still has four health which is enough to keep it alive against most variants of single target removal that don't just immediately trade with it uh like vengeance right so it, it is a very very cool card that i will be building multiple decks around because it is just that i when i saw this card i was like freaking out i couldn't talk but i was just like you know, just like flailing around, <laughs> waving my arms. I love Lord Broadbane, and I cannot wait to mess around with it. That's that's all I gotta say, man. Hunting boar. You know, I saw people like I was looking in the stream, and I saw people just you know go, oh, can't block Keck W. They were like many Keck Ws can't block. It sucks. I think people are not giving this card credit uh, enough credit. I think hunting boar can be really cool. I'm I'm actually thinking about potentially. A cheeky sort of like Froyord Bilgewater deck with uh, both Hunting Boar and let me get, let me show you guys uh, this one right here. The um, I forgot her name. The Wolf Rider. You know, like uh, you can actually combine these with Bilgewater and Vulnerable. You can use stuff like Shakedown. You can kill the Hunting Boar with Shakedown, or you can give vulnerable to uh you know some units and then play the hunting boar and just dive it into something so that it can trade and you can make use of the two power as you're ramping up into your late game plays and there's a lot of very neat payoffs from combining for all your and bilgewater like bilgewater has some surprisingly good late game bombs to, to uh to curve out into like riptide rex which i i, I really wish they would uh they would did, did, did they like re like did they did they buff him actually i i i don't think so <laughs> I, I need to look into that i don't i don't think that happened but it would it would be neat if they did uh, i don't know I, I feel like hunting boar is really interesting in that sense because people have been saying oh a lot about like you know just playing it in shadows and killing it you know but you're paying three mana for it i think the best thing like the best way to play this card is to get something out of the stats right and actually trade into something as you're ramping and I think Bilgewater is an interesting combination for that, but there's there's multiple combinations uh, out there. It's just one of the ones that came to mind first. And I'm just excited to mess around with this card that people have been downplaying a lot. I really like the design. You know, it, you have to think a little bit outside the box to uh, actually make it work. And I think it is very neat for them to print, you know, ramp like this, you know, ramp that you gotta work for, right? Like you, you gotta, I think it's really healthy design, and it's very fun as well. So really, really excited for this card, personally. Harrowing Return. Revive an ephemeral copy of the strongest dead allied follower and give enemies minus one power this round. So this card, like the first thing that comes to mind is Nocturne, right? Uh, combining this with Nocturne is actually really neat because bringing back Nocturne and giving all enemies minus one allows you to go for a crazy attack, potentially. So I think this card could fit into... Uh, you know, some some Nocturne uh, Nightfall builds, uh, which is really exciting, but I think there's more to it for sure. Like, just being able to revive something and spawn it, right? You know, like, I'm, I'm also thinking about the Miratar Reckoner, you know, the, the Fallen Reckoner. And that's... Uh, the, the, the Fallen and the Risen Reckoner. It's not the Minotaur Reckoner. It's the Fallen and the Risen Reckoner. Like, mixing with this as well could be pretty cool. Like, there's there's definitely utility to this card. And I, I like that we have, like, a kind of like a mini harrowing at that. Uh, it's it's pretty cool. And uh, I'm, I'm eager to mess around with it, personally. Then we got a card that people were really freaking out about. You know, Blood in the Water. The Lurk Rally. You know, the Poor Man's Shampoo. Or Shampoo, as I like to call it. Because it is actually a weaker version of Shampoo. Uh, because uh, Shampoo, in case you don't know what it is, Shampoo is a Noxus spell that is also 5 mana and slow that deals 2 to anything and then rallies, right? Well, Bilgewater got a worse version of that, but it's Lurk, which means you can put it into a Lurk deck and it actually doesn't mess. Because that, that's the problem with Lurk, right? If the card is not Lurk, it's hard to justify it being in the deck. But because this thing has Lurk, it's actually a very neat addition for the Lurk archetype. Now... Now, when you build a Lurk deck, you have to take blood into the water in consideration. And maybe you actually have to make a decision deck building and take out a card, a Lurk card out here and there and be like, you know what? I actually, yeah, I need to use my brain cells to actually build this Lurk deck. And that's fantastic. You know, even if it is a little bit, you know, good for Lurk players out there. Fantastic. Legion Deserter, five mana, five, four. 
I gain all allied everywhere buffs. So if you search everywhere, uh, the the biggest payoff that I could find personally uh, as of now is Rumble, right? Uh, because if you play Rumble, you can uh, give Rumbles everywhere impact, quick attack, and spell shield. And that means that the Legion Deserter right here gets all those buffs as well. So that's like the biggest payoff that I've seen for this card. Uh, it's kind of like meant uh, to be an extension of Legion Marauders, in case you're wondering. Because Legion Marauders get everywhere buffs, so, so, does Legion, so does Legion Deserter, which has Overwhelm on top of that. But I feel like there's more potential to that. I'm excited to, to play Legion Deserter in Rumble decks. And maybe maybe Rumble with Legion Marauders, you know? And, and that could actually be pretty legit because Legion Marauders on their own are actually not bad, you know? So, especially with the, the eight mana spell, right? So, yeah, I, I think there is some potential to this card in that regard. And I'll be, I'll be messing around with it. Uh, but it, it, I, it'll be that approach for sure. Then we got Jin, the Virtuoso. The, the Virtuoso, I can say it with a Spanish accent, actually. <laughs> now I can butcher my own main language. So, Jin... The champion that I am most excited for as of right now, uh, the first champion that you'll be seeing on this channel as soon as the expansion hits. I am, uh, you know, I, I, I could be talking about Jin for like forever in this video, but again, I do want to keep this video potentially even like under 40 minutes if it's possible. So uh, yeah, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna go too crazy on, on it. I, I do have a chart here. Uh, I can link it in the description down below. Uh, of like uh, units with uh, skill, as you guys can see here, that that uh, are basically a part of Jin's card pool or region, right? One of the important things uh, here is not only the the stun effects, right, but also very important is the Doom Beast. I think Doom Beast will be a pretty pretty close to a staple for uh, most Jin decks out there because this card is just amazing. It's just really good. The drain effect is very strong, regardless of the archetype that you're playing. And uh, I do feel like Jin, Jin Burn will definitely have a place. Uh, there's just a lot of tools here that you guys can see with, with uh, the early game with the Crash of Corsair, the Saboteur, even the Rookie potentially, but also the Tusk Speaker with the Overwhelm, even the Astro Fox, and of course the Doom Beast. You know, uh, there's a lot of you know nice toys here as as a late game options, but obviously you have to be very picky with them because you can't just stack them all in because you can't have so many eight drops and nine drops so there's more decision making uh, to be made here but the the thing about Jin is that the uh the pool like early on from like one mana to four mana uh, plays is actually not that wide you know it's actually quite limited like there's more options in the late game than there are in the early game so that's going to be very interesting from a deck building standpoint uh, I'm going to be messing around with a bunch of different concepts that I have in mind for Jin. Like I said, I'll be keeping them to myself for now because I want to surprise you guys a little bit with it. And I'm really, really excited to uh, experiment and uh, deck build with this Runeterra champion concept. And uh, yeah, if you guys have any ideas regarding Jin, like, let me know what, what, what would you like to see. Like what combinations, like one that I have in mind, you know, I'll just say, you know, like Jin and Swain, obviously like two, like two of like my all time favorite, like League of Legends champions, even though I don't play League of Legends, but you know, from, from the universe of Runeterra. Yeah, let's go with that. Obviously, that is something that I have to explore. And that's something that's pretty, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you, you haven't heard it here first. But that, that may be, you know, I don't know why. Like, whenever there's, like, a new champion that I'm really excited about, like, the first thing I do is I mix it with Swain. But I, I don't think you guys mind. Because I, I think you guys, you know, you have pretty decent taste. So, like me, you enjoy some Swain. So that that may be something I'll be exploring first. But we'll see. Because I, I, it depends on which idea excites me the most. Uh, which, you know, I'll end up leading off with. But really, really excited for the entire... Uh, Jin package and like I said, I, I could I could go over these cards individually and all these effects But I don't want this video to be like super long So let, let's just move on and actually just talk about the other cards gruesome theater seems to be Jin's signature spell Which is interesting because he's a Runeterra champion, but his signature spell is actually from Ionia uh, This is the card. It's like the the opposite effect of um, of Of the maker right you have the maker and then you have the um, the gruesome theater so a uh, recalling a unit with three or less health like combined with noxus this card can actually be pretty interesting because you can weaken stuff and you potentially recall something for two mana and gain a lot of momentum right even like it, it's, it's a hard card to evaluate though because i feel like in in those cases you just want to be playing ravenous flock instead 
But uh, I don't know how ultimately how relevant this card will be. It doesn't seem like it's that good because I feel like recalling something with less powers is is there's more tricks for that. Because otherwise, like there's something that's very weakened uh, on health, you'd rather just kill than recall. So uh, maybe maybe there is utility for like recalling your own weakened units. There, there's there's some areas to explore with this card, but right now it doesn't seem all that great to me. Maybe I'm missing something about it though. We got the Wharf Rat, which just like, I, I don't know what it is about. This art just kind of like, it's very creepy to me. Uh, I don't know. It's not, it's not the most pretty creature I've ever seen. And uh, yeah, it's a man O3 that has plus one power for each different round you damage the enemy nexus. So, uh, you know, pretty, pretty good addition to Smork decks, but also to Plunder decks as well. As uh, now you actually have to be deciding which two drop to go for as the pool expands and uh, you got some really good stuff for like for example for plunder like uh, well it's not he's not here but the uh, the tusk speaker right makes in really well but it's a pretty smorky card that has uh, potential in that regard inspiring light is a card that I, I feel like it's not getting the respect it deserves. I think people are really downplaying this card. I think uh, it's much better than a lot of people are. Like, I've seen a lot of people on Reddit, like, actually just call this card bad, which is mind-boggling to me, as it is it's doing a lot for two mana. Like, uh, any sort of strategy that spreads out wide, being able to make use of your spell mana. You know, we already know how good that is in decks like Scout, that you, uh, when it comes to uh, cards like Blinding Assault, right? Being able to make use of that spell mana to contribute to your board is really key. And for two mana, just giving a plus one, plus one buff. Yeah, it's slow speed. Yeah, the opponent can interact with it. But I still, like people are, like I saw people saying, well, in scouts, what did you play this? What did you take this out for? Well, what about sharp sight? <laughs> like, dude, are people still playing sharp sight in that deck? Like, this card is really, really neat. And I think it's going to surprise a lot of people. You know, it's a very basic Unga Bunga card, but I think it's not getting the respect that it deserves to get because it's really strong in my eyes. Uh, Undergrowth, three mana, toss three, drain two from a unit. This is the card that I was talking about earlier for deep. Oh my God. Oh my goodness. This card is the tits. For the deep archetype, this card is the absolute... It's just insane. Uh, what more can I say about it? Like, it is a phenomenal addition to Deep. It is an absolute staple as a 3 for Deep, because you're wondering. And this card is so good that it may actually be used outside of Deep, because draining 2 for 3 mana is a pretty damn good deal. And I, I'm even excited to to try this card out in stuff like good old keg control, you know, with bilge water and shadow halls, right? You can enhance the power of this card and actually get some very nasty drains, right, for, for 3 mana. And it's just a... Uh, a really dope card that's going to be so good for the deep archetype. It's crazy. And there's not much more to say about it. Like, one of the best cards uh, when it comes to, like, reinvigorating old archetypes in this entire package. And definitely, definitely going to make an impact. For sure. Really hyped about it, that one. Sands of Time. Give enemy minus two power this round. And then you create an instant sentry in hand. In case you're wondering what an instant... Blah. In case you're wondering what an instant sentry is... It's the uh, the zero mana focus speed spell that allows you to spawn a countdown landmark or advance a landmark for uh, for uh, you know the one that the clockwork uh, does or that the clock hand uh, creates actually. So this card is uh, interesting. I mean, it's pretty expensive at what it's doing. I'm, I'm not sure if it'll fit uh, or it, it kind of like acts as a bit of a frostbite. But in, in Frozen Thralls, for example, you don't play this. Oh, in my opinion, maybe I'm wrong. You know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this card is actually low-key really good for Frozen Thralls. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Because being able to create, being able, being able to like essentially, like especially against uh, spread out strategies. Yeah, maybe I'm undervaluing this card. Because I, I feel like it was designed for Frozen Thralls. I don't quite see it. At least not nowhere near as much as the Harbinger of Thralls. But maybe it's it's definitely justifiable especially depending on the meta as a one-off or as a two-off or maybe i'm just like completely underrating it it's actually really powerful but uh, six mana like it's very specific like you, you have to be facing decks that are going wide right um but it is advancing your game plan and it, it is accomplishing quite a bit right but it's not really as relevant in in it depends on the meta more than anything it'll be more of a tech option i think uh, that's how i see it right now 
Discreet Invitation. Create a fleeting shady character or Kemp up Strider. I, I, I like this card quite a bit. You know, shady character is a pretty nice card to be able to access. And I like, uh, you know, them giving more support for the Kemp up Shredder archetype. That's the thing. And uh, giving you flexibility on top of that with it. So neat design there. Because all the heavens, uh, honestly, seems absolutely god awful. Like, I, I have a hard time believing this card will be really relevant at all. Uh, it's, you know, I, I saw emotional, like, e emotional, like the, the he's a consecrator. Going crazy about this card. Uh, I don't quite agree, though. I, I think uh, this card is pretty trash. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, not really much more to say about it, really. It just doesn't feel very good. Very, very, very expensive for what it's doing. And not really... It just kind of, like, reminds me of, like, the six-mana slow speed spell from Dimasha, you know? And, like, even kind of like a worse version of that, in a way. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not a fan of it, personally. Uh, especially because in, a, in the decks that you want to be playing this, you don't really care that much about, you know, enhancing the power. At least not, in my opinion. So... Yeah, garbage card. I, in my opinion, to be honest, just same. And having that said, we got the Telstone. These are a bunch of Telstones. I'm going to be going over them uh, rather quickly here, though, because uh, we have gone over 40 minutes. I have a lot of cards to talk about. I don't think I rambled too much on any individual card. There was just a lot to discuss, and hopefully you guys enjoyed this video nonetheless. Leave a like if you did. because <laughs> I, I, I love talking about cards, but... Yeah, I don't want my videos to be like incredibly long, so hopefully you guys enjoyed this nonetheless. And uh, yeah, um, you know my voice is still there, like it's 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 weak, but it's persistent. And hopefully the audio is uh, <laughs> the audio is doing fine. You know, I'm, I'm gonna stay optimistic because I, I I feel like uh, I don't know I I feel like I'm more conscious about it, and it doesn't sound that bad with a mic. Um, at least not as bad as I think it's sounding, but yeah, I'm going on a tangent again. So let's talk about the Tell Stones. The Tell Stones are these uh, cards that were revealed today, actually. They are one mana burst speed spells that create, they're essentially like every region gets one and they create three cards. I think this is an attempt, right, um, from Riot to kind of like make irrelevant cards relevant in some way, right? by giving them the uh the three sisters treatment right so gi giving you access to a one mana spell that can actually give you i, I love this, this design by the way i really like this because it essentially makes it so that okay these cards on their own most of them may you may not really justify adding them onto your deck but if they are incorporated onto a card and you can have you know several options it provide you with a a more of like a flexible play then all of a sudden they become much better than, than they are on their own and uh, they actually start seeing play in the meta. And I really like that, even though I do feel like there are some Telstones, you know, like when it comes to the, the, the spells that they chose, that it's, it's a bit weird to me. And I, I'm going to explain that in a bit, right? I, I'm going to actually rank them if I can. At least I'm, I'm going to tell you like what I feel like are like the best three, right? We got the Piltoven, the Piltoven uh, Telstones that creates an, a fleeting aftershock, a Hextech Transmogulator, or a Progress Day. This is one of my personal favorites. Uh, I think uh, this one is really good, actually. It gives you access to either Burn, Removal, or, or Landmark Removal. Hextech Transmogulator can, can, can be really interesting in certain scenarios like in certain matchups like it actually save you <laughs> out of nowhere it can it can just imagine like using this like on a, on a huge tentacle for example right uh, from the new expansion like it can be pretty clutch and if not it can be a, a very powerful draw effect as well right the thing is it's fleeting right so all these effects like you're essentially going for a five mana aftershock or a seven mana transmogulator, or a nine mana progress day, right? So that that's holding it back. I think it's cool. I'm not sure about the power level of this card because the cards themselves, you know, but the flexibility is nice. And uh, I really like this one specifically. I don't like the Shadow Isles one. The Shadow Isles one is really weird to me because it's Mark of the Isles, Spirit Journey, or Crumble. Spirit Journey and Crumble are almost like the same card, right? Like they're five mana. Like one of them is fast speed and the other one isn't. The difference is Crumble can destroy your own unit and to destroy a landmark, right? And Spirit Journey doesn't destroy something, you know, forever, right? So there, there is differences between Spirit Journey and Crumble. But I think, like, the two cards, the two cards are too similar in, in that you don't really benefit from this card as much because the, the big payoff of this is just having different plays, right? And uh, I feel like Shadow, the Shadow Owls one is more limited in that regard. And it's just weird, you know, because you have, like, these two five-mana removals and then Mark of the Owls. 
You know, like, it's just, like, what what decks really benefit from this the most? I, I guess maybe, like, Undyne can benefit from this. Maybe, maybe I'm underplaying it, because I do actually like it in, in, in Undyne, but, you know, I... <laughs> I'm, I'm like one of the few people who actually likes playing the other guy or plays it I guess so we'll see but definitely not really uh it doesn't seem that great the Telstones for bilge water has more powder playful trickster or chum water it's also a bit of a weird one here because uh, you have some some powder keg synergy you you have either that or you have rally or you have uh, the chum the waters. Like I don't know what what decks like actually benefit. Like what decks are actually going to benefit from having these these different options. You know, like they're they're just like very different cards, uh, especially the more powder. Right. It kind of gives me a little bit of Shadow Isles vibes, and I feel like um, maybe I am under underestimating it. But I'm also not really impressed with with the Bilge Water one. I do feel like the Pultover one is better. Uh, then we got the Bandle City one. You create a heroic refrain. A Yoro Contraption or a Keeper's Verdict. I actually have to search these. The fuck is a Heroic Restraint? Or re Refrain. Heroic Refrain. Okay. Give two allies plus two. Let's actually take a look at this real quick. Give two allies plus two plus one this round. All right. And then you have the Yoro Contraption. I, I feel like I should know this one. Yeah, the, the, the Landmark Removal for five mana. And then the Keeper's Verdict. Ah, which is Poppy's signature spell. Yeah. This one actually is pretty decent, I guess. It's pretty alright. Man, these cards are kind of ass, though. <laughs> They're kind of bad. Like, they, these Telstones are really trying to make these, like, shitty cards, like, actually relevant, which is really funny. We got Ionian Telstones, which has a Health Potion, Homecoming, or Stand United. Definitely one of the better ones, in my opinion. Uh... You know, Homecoming is actually a very good spell. It's actually like the one good spell that was incorporated here. And uh, Stay Night is actually not bad at all. And Health Potion is actually pretty neat. You know, sometimes, like that's the, the big weakness with Health Potion is sometimes it's like, what the fuck do I do with this? But now with an Ionian Tell Stones, it can be a Homecoming. Like I feel like the Ionian one for now is easily the best one. As uh, we got the Demacian t uh, Tell Stones here. Which uh, also like Ionian Telso is very relevant because if you're you're playing this with like Isle of the Dragon or any sort of like strategy that revolves around spells, being able to generate you know multiple is actually really neat. Which also makes me think about you know Puffcat Peddler again, right? Like I haven't played Puffcat Peddler in a while. Like, maybe some Telstones with the with the Peddler, interesting. Okay, we got the Telstones for Demacia. We have Prismatic Barrier, Detain, or for Demacia. Pretty all right, you know, pretty flexible in that sense. And uh, definitely some potential there. Again, maybe like an Ionia Demacia combination with I Have the Dragon could work because you can also spread out with uh, some token units and use for Demacia or just use it as plain removal uh, or to protect your units. Uh, not as good as the Ionia one, I think, but pretty decent, I guess. Uh, I think the Targonian one is the worst one, right? It has Wish, Paddle Star, or Blessing of Targon. Blessing of Targon was the, um, the uh, plus three, plus three, like the... Uh, Terex Singer spell. Yeah, this one is actually like I think the worst because <laughs> Wish and Paddle Star. <laughs> this one's just garbage, man. Like this was this was actual garbage. But to be fair, it, in in Targon, I, th I think that's very very fine. Like yeah, this one's like really bad. But Targon already has like good stuff for this, you know, like good spells. Like like they have the uh, the gifts from Beyond, for example, right? So yeah, but definitely really bad. The Noxian Telstones uh, give you Sharpened Resolve, which is the plus three, plus two, uh, three mana burst speed combat trick. Whirling Death, or Weapons of the Lost, which is the eight mana one that deals three damage and spawns a Trifarian Shield Breaker. Uh, uh, yeah, kind of ass. Kind of ass. <laughs> Not much more to say about it. Pretty bad, too. And then Shereem and Telstones creates a fleeting Ruthless Predator, Weight of Judgment, or Spirit Fire. Ruthless Predator, the two mana burst speed. Uh, Reggaeton signature spell, basically. Weight of Judgment is a four mana uh, slow speed spell that can deal seven damage to a follower or two damage to a champion. You know, kind of a weird card as well. And Spirit Fire, the seven burst speed uh, spell that uh, gives minus two power to everything and then deals two damage to everything. Uh, from the opponent, I mean. So, 
you know, actually not bad cards. Like, uh, I could see this card, like, maybe, like, Swain, Sharima, for example. Like, you could see this uh, because there, there is some similarities between these two. And Ruthless Planner can also be there to ease up the path for a Swain Nexus Strike as well by removing the, uh, the Fearsome Blocker, like, amongst other things. Like, it's actually... There is some potential in the Shuriman one. I'd say that um, the Ionian one is the best. Like, without a doubt. Um, where's the Froyard one? Oh, Froyard doesn't have one. Because they have three sisters. Oh, I was really eager to see the Froyard one. But they, they already have three sisters. So I, I, guess, uh, I, I guess they're not giving them that. Okay, so Ionia I would place the, as the first. Um, I think afterwards... Um, I believe the Piltover one is pretty decent, even though it's not it's not amazing, but it's it's all right. The I, the Shurima one is also okay. The Demacia one seems like the second best one, though. I go Ionia, Demacia, and then and then either Piltover or Shurima. You know, because um, I don't know about the uh, the Bandle City one actually, and I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm very okay with that. So that's that's that, and uh, we actually yeah we, we actually went over 50 minutes, so I failed completely. But to be fair, that was a lot to talk about. I did it though. I reviewed the cards. I went over a lot of them, and uh, I gave you guys my my thoughts on them. Uh, again, really really excited for this expansion. Really like the uh, the Telstone design, nonetheless. I will I will eventually be experimenting with all of them, and uh, I am very. I'm eager to be wrong about some of them in regards to their power level. And overall, just phenomenal expansion, man. It's, it's looking so damn exciting, and I cannot wait. Uh, I cannot wait for more reveals. I can't wait to see, because we still got a lot of cards to see. You know, we got we to gotta see, like, the new champions. There's still two more. Uh, there's been a hint at, like, Annie and Bard, and I'm, I'm like, I've been asking for Annie ever since I got into Legend of Runeterra. So really excited for that champion and, and and super eager to see what she does and i just i can't wait man it's it's super exciting like it i i, I wasn't as excited like that last expansion for religion of Ventura was a bit of a disappointment overall i think it was the worst expansion but i think this one is looking to be one of the very best and i am so eager for it so that's where i'm gonna leave it at uh, i'm gonna rest my voice a little bit and hopefully you guys enjoyed this video uh, long ramble but again, <laughs> had a lot of cards to talk about. Man. I, I don't think I could have done this any faster. And uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed this kind of video. And uh, let me know if you're also excited for, you know, actual gameplay content as well. Like, I'm going to be working on that too. And yeah, I'm going to stop talking. So you guys watching, stay tuned for daily Legends of Runeterra content. Have a soul day. Hope you enjoyed. Leave a like if you did. Love ya. I'll see you tomorrow.